It occurs to me, David, that you're the first person in now over 20 people to endure the unfiltered experience. You're the first sitting MP, which makes me wonder how guarded you already are, because when Nick Clegg was sat in that chair, you could almost sense the liberation that he'd been able to enjoy since losing his seat, although that may sound. There's a slightly different tension when you're sitting, because if you, you know, trip up or say something that you later regret, the fact that you're still in Parliament makes it newsworthy in a way that perhaps... Perhaps it isn't when you're not. Yeah, I think that there's this... I mean, I've got to a stage where I don't feel like I'm that bothered about climbing the greasy pole. I'm not, um, you know, crawling up anyone's backside. I'm not... And I also think that the currency of the constituency I represent means that I have to speak truthfully and authentically. That sometimes means that I'm not in line with the Labour Party or a particular leader, um, uh, you know, and I sometimes get into trouble because I, I'm uncompromising in my language. So um, I suppose it depends at what stage you are in the game. But I genuinely believe that we're, we're experiencing such extraordinary political times that the kind of bland, overspun, overconsidered, poll tested yes. responses don't cut it. I, I, increasingly so. And yet you've never, and I, I could have got this wrong, but you've never been really badly monstered by the Mail or the Sun or anyone like that, have you? Uh, well, well, I've had I've had crap thrown at me. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I've, you know, um, but yeah, I, I, I suppose, I, well, I'm still here. Yes. <laughs> um, it's been 18 years. Um you know, uh, there have certainly been things I picked up the paper and didn't like. Of course, but, but no, had... what I'm sort of referring to is that you've managed to pursue issues uh, that look closely at everything from Grenfell to the overrepresentation of um, black and minority ethnic young people in prison. You, 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 you make trouble, but somehow you've never fallen into that position of the story being more about you than the cause. So when I mean, you've got a small ego, really, I haven't ever thought of it like That's that. That's why but you're here, mate. I get, well, the thing is, I don't. What I don't do is, I'm not rent a rent a sort of no. rent a gob. I don't. I get loads of media inquiries to say things, and most often I don't say anything. That's interesting. I stick to the issues that I care about, and that is I that think rare? Are, do you think most MPs just have yes on their answer phone? I don't. I. I think there are some that just jump up and down too much. There are some that you don't know what issues that they're. You know, they're sort yes. of there on everything. Um, some are a little bit invisible, I guess. Mm. Um, I tend to stick on the issues, you know, tough domestic policy, um, issues of poverty, race, class, education, crime. That's kind of what I'm known for. I'm not generally speaking, jumping up and down on defence issues, although I'm against Trident. Um, uh, and I'm not generally known for lots of foreign policy positions, uh, although generally speaking, if there's a war coming, uh, you, you'd usually find me wanting to vote against. Um, so, you know, if, if you stick to the issues that you know, then I think you probably are going to be all right. And, and yet, I, I mean, from where I'm sitting, that's a bit, that's quite rare. I mean, ordinarily, it's not just politicians these days, but pundits and punters alike are supposed to have a pungent opinion on pretty much every subject under the sun. You sit, it sits very comfortably on you saying to journalists, does it, sorry, this isn't an area that I particularly know about. Well, actually, my, my guy just says no. That's just, he's got a gatekeeper. <laughs> he, he just says no, sorry. No, uh, there's a long, long list you know, of journalists. You've got a relationship that... with them. They, and the people come to know that you're just not going to be available. You're not a rent I've also got three kids. I mean, I don't, and uh, that matter to me a huge amount. So I'm not, you know, I haven't, I can't spend all my Sundays in, in, in the TV studios. It, politics is not the only thing in my life. Um, uh, uh, you, you know, um, no, I get that, that's that. the honest I, truth. I like it, though. No, I, mean, I, I, I like it because it, it, what it means is that when, when I'm researching the interview with you, there aren't um, there aren't many stories that are about anything other than your politics and your political campaigning. So let's, let's until today, until today, <laughs> we get cut to the heart of the man, David Lammy, live and unleashed. Um, fatherhood, you mentioned parenthood, important to you in part because your dad disappeared when you were twelve. Yes, or he literally walked out of your life and. He walked out of my my life. Um, I remember saying goodbye to him on a platform in King's Cross. 
and um, I didn't see him again. Um, did, did you know that was? No, I didn't know that that was the, you know, he was going to America. At, I mean, his, my, my mother, him and my mother had a pretty tempestuous um, marriage, um, lots of rows, it wasn't easy. Um, but the story was he was going to America. This was the sort of early 1980s. And actually a lot of West Indian families at that time were moving on from Britain to the States. Um, and he was going to join some friends and maybe pave the way for us to, to, to join him. Um, but the bottom line is he, he, you know, he never came back and it was tough. My mother was on about 12 grand a year at the time. I remember she was um, a West Indian country girl at heart. My dad had done a lot of the sort of, my dad was much more urbane and um, probably educated than my mother. And so it was bloody hard for her to navigate um, just the state, really, dealing with schools, dealing with um, finances, all those sorts of things that you that you have to do on your own. And I kind of, I think I sort of, I was quite precocious, so I sort of stepped up to support You're her. You're the oldest? I wasn't the oldest. There were five of us, but um, my... Uh, certainly one of my brothers had had sort of left home by then. Another was on his way out. These are older brothers. Another one lived in the Caribbean and, my, and there was my younger sister. So it was a tough, rough time. I remember a lot of stigma around not having a dad. How long did it take for the penny to drop? How, how long did you sustain the belief that this was a temporary arrangement and that you, you might all be going out to join him? Did he keep in touch with your mum at oh, first? No, I think or? it became clear we weren't going out to join him after about six or seven months. Hmm. Uh, but that didn't mean that there wasn't a deep, deep, I remember wells and wells of he's going to come back. Yeah. And that awful thing that kids feel, I think my sister feel it, felt it more acutely than I did, of um, of blame, really. You know, what, why has what did he I left? Do wrong? What did I do wrong? It's my fault. Um, he left a really big hole. He left a really big hole in me and a really big hole in my family. And at that point, you know, if I could go back, I, you know, I'd love to tell the sort of young David Lammy that it does get better and that actually by the time you're, um, you know, 46, um, it won't feel quite as big as it did then. But, sure. but, it, but, it, but it was bad. And he'd obviously been a good dad then up until that point. I did rouse and... He, Notwithstanding, he, to leave such a big hole, he must have played quite a big role, or not? Yeah, he 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 was a, he he had a big personality. Yes, uh, he used to drink too much. Um, you know, he used to like the bookies, um, um, but he had a big personality. Um, you know, he was my dad. I loved him. Um, would you spend time with him? Did you? Yeah, he he didn't drive. Okay. So I spent hours and hours walking across North London with him somewhere. Um, he was very big on extended family. He used to take me to Spurs, um, which was incredibly special and rare in those days because there weren't many kind of black dads that no. took their sons to Spurs. Um, no, uh, no black players either at that there, point. It was a few years before Cyril Regis not, at not West Not at Spurs, no, no. 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 Yes, yeah, this, this is before then. And he, um, he, he he wore his race very easy. My dad had loads of white friends, loads of Irish friends that he would drink in in the pub. He, he was not, um, in some sense, he was not the typical West Indian man of that era. Sure. Um, and in other ways, he was. And in other ways, he was. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, you know, I, I, I missed him. And it's why I, um, you know, have made it my business to try and um, communicate issues of fatherhood in, in, in Parliament and public life, to, um, to recognise the, the huge pain of not just... Um, uh, folk in the black community, but people growing up without dads, and also the position of fathers in society, which has changed hugely. Mm. But there's lots of policy areas like shared parental leave um, uh, and issues like that that we just, we, you know, we're crap on in Britain, basically. Uh, and and th I mean, the examples are there, aren't there? The, the Scandinavian examples on shared parental leave in particular are, are, are exemplary. So these are winnable wars. These are climbable mountains that you have in front of you. Yeah, we've got this strange situation in, in politics at the moment where the public are way ahead of the political class. And broadly speaking, the way I would caricature that is the Conservatives are 
absolutely hung up on marriage, tax breaks for marriage, to some extent a 1950s understanding of the family. Um, clearly, many of them are very patrician. They have the money or yes. their friends have the money. They work in the city. Mum can stay at home. Dad's rolling in an easy 250 plus thousand a year. Um, most British families, both couples have to work. There is yes. no choice. No, absolutely. <laughs> um, um, and actually, the way that the economy's been set up, the Treasury has worked it out. It, it, it wants uh, both couples yes. working. And the property market um, demands it. And well. the property I mean, market demands it. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question of two, uh, of one millennium buying a home. You know, you've got to get together. Yeah, and, you know, and And if you're lucky, <laughs> uh, when you're 80, you can buy one. So, so, so yeah, so there's a, so the Conservatives are stuck in, in a sort of, um, small C conservative 1950s place. And then I think one of the problems with the Labour Party is that we have been so associated with the party of rights, particularly, and I don't, you know, I, I would associate myself with that, mm. uh, women's rights mm. and children's rights, that somehow we struggle to talk about the family. I, you know, when you yeah. get a... <laughs> it will get all uneasy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, this well, is, because this there's is, a judgment involved, because this is the tension yeah. that you have to juggle, yeah. because especially with your background, <laughs> you, you are, uh, I mean, seeking to... Uh, make it easier for fathers to, to carry on playing a role in the family, even if the relationship has failed. But you're also somehow supporting the single mother while tacitly acknowledging or implicitly acknowledging that that, that is not the ideal scenario. That's why Labour fight shy of it, because there's, there's that little silent message that, well, if we put in too much effort on the family, then we're kind of telling the single mums that they're second class parents. I, I guess so. And I, look, I've done a lot of work with, with young fathers. You know, you can't solve the problem, for example, of teenage pregnancy if you aren't talking to young fathers as well. <laughs> this is, this and is, a real this is biology, yeah, yeah. biologically <laughs> sound. No, it's a real issue, you know, so you get the sort of liberal into the, Labour yeah. um, midwife mm. uh, or the liberal Labour social worker or the liberal Labour, um, um, you know, district nurse that that doesn't even want that young guy in the house when they arrive. Right, yeah. Doesn't want that young that, guy yeah, on the I ward see. when the baby's born. Gosh. They, and, and typically that young guy is white working class or uh, uh, black working class, might be a bit monosyllabic, yeah, of course. might be wearing a hoodie. And actually the system conspires to shut him out. That's so really interesting. I've wanted to sort of bring those issues to the fore, basically. Um, and surface some of the tensions that exist even within my own party that mean that um, actually, just let's take shared parental leave. Why don't we move on shared parental leave? Because we've made huge progress on maternity leave, paid maternity leave quite rightly. But what we're not prepared to do, the, or the, the argument that happens in the, in the Labour Party is, if we have shared parental leave, we'll be taking some money off mum mm and giving it to dad, and dad might run off to the pub and spend it. And so that <laughs> rationale, it's the rationale behind the family allowance yeah, originally, yeah, isn't it? Right. The idea and, that you need to protect mum from dad. Yeah, that's right. Child benefit's not given to dads either for that reason. Now, look, I it's just think there are loads of couples out there that want to make the choice for themselves. And the coalition tried to move in this direction, but it felt from the outside when they um, brought in the... Uh, shared potential shared leave. It felt like a bone that no one really understood that Cameron had just sort of tossed to Nick Clegg to keep him quiet for a couple. Well, of I weeks. think it's had a two percent take it's up. It's had no take up at it's all. Not, it's weird, it's, isn't it? It's not properly paid. No one understands what it uh, is. And it, I, you know, let's be absolutely blunt. I think there would be very few working class listeners who could afford to take it up. Yeah. Um, it feels like a very very middle class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, preoccupation. It does. So despite this background and this passion, you, you, you told a story yourself about being on holiday with with your son, who at the point where you stopped playing with him, he burst into tears. And when you got to the bottom of why, it was because he felt you'd never had time for him. Yeah, God, I don't think he'd say that now, I hope. Um, so how old this was, was he then? This was, oh, he would have been about four or five, I reckon. And how old is he now? Uh, my eldest is 12. Okay. So this would this is going back to life when we were in government. Yes. Uh, when I was a minister, um, sort of working full on um, under Blair and Brown. And um, yeah, I wanted to kind of be honest about the, 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 the realities of kind of juggling a, a high intense 
university job, and that's mm. not just because of being a minister. It's all because I represent Tottenham, yes. which is a you know, is one of Britain's busy constituencies. <laughs> busy constituencies, and um, yeah, and 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 actually, just to be honest, I think there are loads of blokes that feel like this, but but that time to chill and to play and to be did not feel like it was there. And you know, I have to say when my wife first got pregnant, I was really nervous about becoming a dad because I I didn't feel I'd had a great role model for a dad myself. I didn't really know what I was doing. Mm. Um, uh, I initially wanted um, a girl because I just felt like well, it would be a bit easier. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> and so, but I've just had to put one foot in front of the other and, 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 and try my best and actually realise that the most important thing is kind of turning up and being there and sort of still being there, really. Um, but, yeah, I've always wanted to try and be honest about the struggles within that. And your boy, as you, as you mentioned, is around about the age now that you were when your dad left, a, a, right. a couple of years that, old. Yeah. What, yeah, what, 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 what were you like at 12, regardless of, of what oh, was going on God. between your mum and oh, dad? You God. said if you could go that back, you'd, such a good question you'd tell him not that it, things get better, yeah, but what would, yeah. you, what, would, what would we see if yeah. we came with you? Oh, I think I was um, precocious. I think I was um, not terribly worldly. I think I I was, um, at that stage in my life, I had very much grown up in Tottenham, in a city, um, and um, my world was very small. It, you know, my world was really between Tottenham High Road and Holloway. Right. Um, and then I got this scholarship, um, um, this Billy Elliot moment. I, you know, for, <laughs> but for me it wasn't a ballet, but it, it was a dress. I, I ended up being a cathedral chorister in Peterborough. How did that um, come about then? I mean, you... cause, well, because this was the age of Alid Jones. No, I um, get that. But your mum, you've mentioned, wasn't that plugged. That sounds yeah. like the something that the, the child of a parent who was very plugged into opportunity no. would would end up doing. Yeah. How did David Lammy end up? Was it? Yeah. So what my mum did have going on was church. Right. We were dragged to church every Sunday. Um, um, and between the local vicar and the primary head teacher, David's got a really good singing voice. Maybe he should choir to a, a choir school. And they helped my mum fill in the forms and all the rest of it. My big brother helped as well. And it's that's that's how it happened, basically. And I got this scholarship to, uh, I always say, a state boarding school, cathedral school, which King's was in Peterborough. And I went off to board there. And so basically what I'm saying is at 12, I was between these two worlds. That yes. actually went on for some time. That that dislocation that you can feel when you're working class and you've got permission maybe to be something else, but you don't know if you want to be this something You're conscious else. of these doors yeah, opening yeah. that you didn't know existed before, let yeah, alone yeah. would open One, I was you. black in an all-white school. Were you literally the only yes. black boy then? <laughs> Yes. Uh, two, it was the time of the Tottenham riots, so there was a lot of strife going on back home. Three, I was emotionally pretty insecure. My dad had left. I was gauche. I was, you know, a bit innocent, a bit naive, a bit wet. I was quite wet. Kind of or guy. sweet, depending on... Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah. So That's I, an I, amazing I, yeah. juxtaposition, isn't it? I, I, I wasn't aware of that because the, the contrast between the two worlds is immense. I went to a boarding public school and, and my home life was nowhere near as grand as that of some of my friends. So I, I felt I had to deal with a degree of dislocation. But to be essentially living in in Tottenham during the school holidays and then living in the back end of the 19th century during term time, yeah, that must have yeah. been... and there Because it's ancient traditions yeah, in that kind yeah, of cathedral that, oh, environment. Yeah, that, I mean, truly right. ancient. Very ancient traditions. You, 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 you sort of land on it. You know, singing um, the Mozart Mass in yes. C minor in Peterborough Cathedral, it's a great, huge cathedral. It's kind of, you know, and you're following on hundreds of years of history. The school was set up by Henry VIII. But yet you're coming back to Tottenham and... Half my family lived in Broadwater Farm. You're coming back to Stop and Search. You're coming back to, um, you know, not a lot of money um, in the house and some of the stresses that my mum had. Um, um, I had elder brothers, um, um, uh, one of whom was getting into trouble with the police. You know, it, so it was, it was a, uh, you know, it was a big dislocation. I guess the truth is I made up my mind 
that I was going to do everything to try and be successful. And in that sense, as I emerged into sort of 14, 15, I became a bit of a sort of Eliza Doolittle. You know, I, I would practice my elocution do you know, in the mirror and stuff like I, that. I was about to ask you whether or not you had two voices, one in North London and one in Peterborough. But you didn't. You had one voice which you sought to change. Well, yeah. were there two little David Lammies? Was yeah, that, I mean, you wouldn't yeah. walk even in the same way yeah, around Tottenham yeah. that you'd walk around the cloisters, would you? Well, I think I probably began not to completely fit right. in Tottenham, in truth. Yes. Um, James, no one's really pressed me on this before, so I'm not well, take your time. I, I, guess, <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess the truth is, I think I was quite lucky that I came back to London and went to SOAS in London, School of Oriental and yeah. African Studies, because it was a left-wing, militant, and, if you like, um, race-conscious kind of place to go. And that re that earthed me back right. in something very real. And so I'd begun to, to, to live more happily with being these two people. But I think my teenage years, yeah, I probably was, was pretty insecure really yes. about where I'd come from and where I wanted to go to and the, the, the tension between those two things is is it, it's fascinating to, that you mentioned ending up at SOAS where you kind of you go all in on on who you are now I, I sense if I've understood you correctly there was a sort of flirtation with fraudulence in your teenage years a sort of trying to fit in at school would have meant in a yes. way, changing who you were. Certainly, were you ever embarrassed by your background? Oh, God, yeah. Right. I remember having a 16th birthday party, and I've still got the friends now, and they came back to my oh, that's home in, in, in Tottenham. And, of course, it was nothing like their homes. No. And there was. A, there was embarrassment at a, a kitchen that was all broken down. And, um, you know, you know, West Indians like their doilies and their, 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 they collect <laughs> what, what, you, what a lot of folk call tat. Yes. I mean, actually, working class Brits do the same thing, so it's all fine. Uh, Another Irish uh, parallel, actually. It's a big Irish thing. Uh, as and well, Irish it? do it, parlor. so that's why I love them. Yeah. Um, um, but, and you're yeah, conscious of that. I was but very not... conscious of that. But, 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 uh, <laughs> but the point is, um, you kind of, you know, you... Thank God you get to a place where you are comfortable with being who you are, if you're knowing lucky. where you if you're stand lucky, in the you ground. Do. Some people yeah, some, never get some that. Some people don't get that. Hmm. They, 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 they um, you know, uh, I don't want to put it all in racial terms, but um, no, of course. I, you know, I, I see with those wrestling with mixed race heritage that also, who am I, what am I, I'm looking in two directions. Uh, I, I see it in my own children. So, it, you know, it, it, traveling from being working class to being middle class, mm. uh, being a woman in the work, these are, the, the, so I, I don't wanna, um, being gay and coming out, these are the, the that journey, um, you know, some people achieve it, some people don't, and you get it at different points in your life. Certainly as I sit here today, um, I hope people can tell yes. <laughs> when I'm when I'm speaking truth to power. Yes. I am who I am. Take yeah, well, I, That's what I mean. I'm way past the business of of pretending to be something I'm not. Well, you, you exude it. Actually, you're incredibly comfortable in your own skin, and that's why I wonder what you meant when you were 14 or 15 when you decided you wanted to be successful. Because successful to the 14 year old you didn't mean necessarily the things you've just been talking about, the inner peace, the the, the, the comfort. What did you mean by such Did you just mean rich, famous, uh, wealthy, posh? Uh, certainly. Living um, in the kind of house your school friends grew up in? Yeah. I think having some money and resources, not being as stressed out as my mother I worked out. You were conscious of that yeah. as a young man. You could yeah. see that she was... Yeah, very stressed. I mm. mean, she. you know, both my parents are dead. They were dead at 67. Gosh. Um, when I think of my university mates, um, they're, they're all their parents are still alive. Mm. Some of them are still skiing at sort of 81 or something, you know, <laughs> yes. a completely different experience. So, yes. um, and that's the same actually for all of my friends from Tottenham, you know, um, so stress kills. Um, I didn't want that. Um, I decided I wanted to be a barrister, you know, I didn't know any barristers, didn't know any lawyers. Where did that come people. from then? Where did that? 
there were two shows on TV. One was when we were a bit younger was Crown Court, yeah. which I loved, yeah. and the other was LA Law, right? Uh, which is so one so of the reasons why I ended up going to so, Harvard. So by the somewhere way. in between the two, the Crown uh, Court for people not familiar with it, it was yeah. kind of a live, it was a live reenactment yeah, of was, case it could be a shoplifter like in Preston, Judge couldn't Judy. it? Well, yeah, yeah, it was a bit rough around the edges. Um, so, so you just felt that I could do. So you were, presumably you knew good at talking. You quite enjoyed having the floor. Am I right? I had the gift of the gab. The gift of the gab. And yeah. and, and barristry is, or yeah. the law yeah. is an obvious, yeah. it's usually yeah. journalism, law or politics That's with right. people with your That's gift. Right. That's right. I, I, I had the gift of the gab. I like the humanities, English, history, yes. religious studies, geography. Uh, I love drama. Um, I, you know, I didn't think I'd get any work if I became an actor. Um, I was probably a little bit more, you know, I was quite cerebral, so I thought law would work. And I had a powerful sense of justice. Let me just be absolutely ah. clear. The other thing that had happened is the dislocation, the Tottenham riots, the juxtaposition of wealth as against poverty, constantly seeing those differences, um, suddenly realising that some people struggle and some people don't, being subjected to a serious racism and prejudice, people constantly wanting to hold me back and say I couldn't do something. Uh, Nelson Mandela was in prison and Margaret Thatcher didn't seem to care and sanctions, the Birmingham Six, all of that era and that period gave me a powerful sense of social justice. I suppose. So that's in the end why I became a, a, a lawyer and a barrister. But you're describing events rather than inspiration. It's odd that so far, and, and, and no, we may but, just have missed it out, but there's no role model here. There's no one that you're following. <laughs> but I had a huge poster of, of Nelson Mandela and Bill Cosby <laughs> in my room. They were my dad. Well, one, they, of the, one of them's <laughs> still got their reputation <laughs> intact. I, I, I you've got to understand, at that time, Bill Cosby was a bit of a hero. <laughs> Yeah, of course uh, less was. so yeah, now, yeah, but well, what I'm okay. saying is, you know... So, so because they, I mean, Bill Cosby, Cosby because he was so successful and famous and funny, there's no political inspiration there, really. No, no, but with but Mandela, it was because you came alive then. You know, I mean, there was a, I could almost see the the student activist then with the with the list of things that you took personally and you were angry about, and not just race issues, but Irish innocent Irishmen that's being locked right, up for bombings right, they hadn't committed. So there's an establishment already emerging in your politics. That's right, and it's your enemy. That. that, that yeah, I suppose it was just a sense of of injustice. Or you're its enemy. Yeah, and I and I I found myself when I was stopped and searched. Or do you remember the first time, David? Yeah, I think I was about twelve or thirteen back in Tottenham. Um, uh, probably actually, probably after the riots. Okay. Um, where there were loads of police around, um, being stopped and searched, and being, to put it bluntly, shit scared, mm. uh, because. Um, there was such mistrust. You just assumed you were going to get framed. You were just, oh my God, I'm going to be thrown in the back of a van, taken, beaten. Going to find a bag of weed uh, in your I'm, pocket that gonna, wasn't there. The they, yeah, yeah. All that sort of stuff. Just terrified. Absolutely Gosh, terrified. Such a young my age. biggest fear was going to prison. That was my biggest fear. All of the older boys had seem to have stories of spending time in custody, time in prison. And all I had going for me was um, kind of the ability to talk myself out of, uh, out of trouble, yeah. um, the, the ability to move out of street talk into something slightly more middle class, um, the ability to be a bit more sort of church-like and charming and innocent. And that was the only thing in those moments I had going for me that seemed to keep me on the straight. Now, it wasn't always easy. And I did, you know, there were some scrapey moments. Mm. Let's be honest. It wasn't a sort of, you know, a pure part. Well, I'm not talking about them now, but there were some moments that were hairy. Um, okay. But I got through. Uh, tell me about the first time you were stopped and searched. Because for, for a middle class white guy, it's impossible. The, I, all the empathy in the world, I can read a million different accounts of it, but I will never know what that feels like. And I'll never really be able to imagine it. So tell me. Um, there were two officers on a road called Lawrence Road in Tottenham. It connects to West Green Road. It wasn't very far from my home. Um, they said there had been a, a mugging. In those in those days, there was, you know, mugging was the thing. Yeah. Um, they sort of pushed me against the wall. Um, they frisked me. I, um, I almost burst into tears. I almost wet myself. And I felt like the whole of the street was looking at them when they were doing it. That's how I remember it. Yeah. Shame. While knowing you hadn't done anything wrong. 
I haven't done it. I mean, I hadn't done anything. Oh, no, yeah, but that's the hardest thing to process, that sense. Because when people say, well, you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, you you feel the whole world is looking at you, being treated like a criminal. I I suppose this this gets picked up in the, obviously, the review that I was asked to for the government on... um, the criminal justice system. Uh, the criminal yeah. justice system and the ethnic minorities and, and why they're why they're so present in the, the criminal justice system in the way that they are. And I guess what people don't fully understand is if you're a young black man growing up in Tottenham or Hackney, you experience what I've just described uh, 20, 30 yeah. times before you get to the age of 25. Because now we've with 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 knife crime and gun crime and other things, it, it feels acute to you, mm. um, and um, and it, and it, and there feels an injustice. And the other thing is, it drives a sense, uh, assuming you've done nothing wrong, that the police are not on your side, and you don't want to talk to the police, and you don't want to share with the police. And all of the evidence is, of course, that it doesn't actually solve the problem unless mm. it's intelligence led and you kind of know when they say oh there's been a mugging as yeah, they said to me has. or there's been a knife crime that actually the, the net's been thrown very wide and you simply happen to be a black male walking down the street um because there is this thing isn't there of people not you know because an officer in the met can be can be could, could have come from cheshire yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. 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 they don't particularly no. y- you look like you know hang on but uh, that guy looked nothing like me no. but you know but that you you, you know you'll get rounded up sort of thing um and it's a slippery slope because i mean as i said the other day look um so let's just say you're 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 you're, you're 15 and actually you've got a bit of weed in your pocket um if you're walking down tottenham high road uh, or cold harbour lane in brixton or hackney you're probably going to get arrested and you're going to get a criminal record. And there's a slippery slope that begins yes. and it begins and, and it leads to a place where you're not going to get a job. Suddenly your name's on a register of having a criminal record. Um, uh, it was hard enough to get a job because of the colour of your skin. Now you've got a criminal record. It drives you towards crime, actually. Mm. Uh, and guess who pegs up the bill? The taxpayer, because a third of people on Job Seekers Allowance... Um, have a criminal record. Right? Um, if you're that same, let's, let's say you're a little bit older, you're now 18 or 19, uh, you're that same kid at a campus university, let's pick on Warwick, you're having a joint. The police are nowhere in sight. Mm. In fact, if the police were called, people would think you were wasting police time. It may even be that there's a lecturer at Warwick University having a joint with you <laughs> or nearby. Yes. It's two different, very different outcomes for the same problem. Um, and so that's that that's the big that's the, the the heart of why there's a lack of trust in the system. And it's the heart of your politics. It's the heart of my politics. It's one of the hearts. Of my, I think, I've, well, this idea yeah. of of inequality and unfairness is what I'm hearing you describe. You've used one example of it, but all the other things you listed that you cared about are examples of inequality and unfairness. Equality before the law for someone who who, who shortly after this became a barrister, equality before the law would be one of the most obvious principles. Yes. James, I'm sort of feeling like I should be doing therapy. I've oh, never done therapy. Like therapy. I'm not as self-aware as I perhaps should be. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm only learning from what dots. you're telling me. So. <laughs> Quite like so, but, but that, that is, that is uh, what's coalescing right. for me. Yeah. And, yeah. and at SOAS, this process accelerated. Why did you feel so empowered? Was it because of that life-changing experience at the age of 13, you thought, if I can end up being a chorister, being the only black chorister in Peterborough, then why the, why the bloody hell shouldn't I be a barrister? You never felt constrained by your background, I don't oh, think. Oh, no, look, I did feel constrained. And I I would say also that, that the real empowerment did not come... Uh, SAS was a wonderful experience. I loved it. I loved being back in London. I loved the militancy. It was a... It was an extraordinary time. I remember Margaret Thatcher walking out of number 10. It was yeah. just an extraordinary time to, 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 to be at university. But the truth is the kind of real confidence came a bit later because right. I, I found myself at Harvard Law School 
Um, it was an accident. There were some black kids ahead of me who were applying to the British Bar School wanting to be barristers, and they were suing because they weren't getting through the course. I thought, bloody hell, if that's their experience, I better have a plan B. As I said, I've been watching LA Law. There was a black guy in LA Law, so I thought, <laughs> let's apply to Harvard. I applied to Harvard. I got in, and they said, we really, really want you to come because you'll be the first black Briton to come to Harvard Law School. I said, what, really? Um, um your mum was still alive at this point. My mum was still alive. Just give me a yeah. little line on how proud she was. Oh, God. She, well, she, I think she told the whole of Tottenham. I mean, the whole of Tottenham knew my mum and, 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 and knew about this fact. But of course, that was we, magic. We, it was cost 45 grand. We didn't have the money to go. Sheesh. So I had to beg, borrow, and literally steal the money. And I, I got some help from some wonderful um, um, Jewish, actually, lawyers who really took it upon themselves to try and help me because they... I think they just understood the context of being other, being different and, and helping me be that first guy to go. And I'm very grateful for that forever. And um, and it was there that I got the confidence. It right. was that institution that gave me the confidence. Why? Why because, oh, just because to be at a place where... You're on top of the world. Yeah, there, you know, loads of incredible speakers pass through it. Um, you know, if you go to the library and you say, have you got this book and they haven't got it, they're embarrassed and they get it. Um, um, there was a sort of excellence, really, that you one was exposed to. Um, American academics are a bit different to, to some of the sort of well, it has, it's converged a bit now, but American many of them are very plugged in also to they've got television shows, they right. they work for the Clinton administration, yeah. they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, radio shows, you know. <laughs> so it was, a, it was an amazing... Public amazing, intellectuals. Yeah, You're public just, which intellectuals. We don't really That's have a here. much better yeah. way of putting it, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, 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 so it was, it, it, was, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I guess the other thing is, look, let, let's be honest, I... Um, there's a long trodden journey, I think, of 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 the kind of uh, uh, ethnic minority, minority European experience, um, traveling to the United States and taking huge empowerment from from the African American experience, and that I, I you know, you know. Um, mm -hmm. The African American middle class that exists is is not something you can kind of feel as in the same way back here. That's why you had Bill Cosby and, on and, the wall, and that was that was that was that gave me a certain kind of confidence. Yes. Def definitely, which you brought back to Britain. Definitely, I and I came back to Britain, and very shortly after that, actually, even though I came back to practice law, I came back. Um, I became I became the MP for Tottenham, Bernie Grant, um, who I knew and loved. And was a wonderful man. Um, um, died um, um, way too young. I mean, he was in his late fifties. Um, he had um, kidney failure, and I had, I was, I was involved in the Labour Party. I was kind of known to be in and around, very associated with Tottenham. This new yes. kid, up and coming. Uh, I had actually run for the London Assembly, okay. the new London Assembly. Ken Livingstone was back and I became remarkably a, um, a, an Assembly member because I was sort of second on the list after Trevor Phillips at that time. Uh, I, no one thought that, you know, I did not think I could become an MP. That's why I ran for the London Assembly. But but um, it, it, it all just happened and off I went. And first day in the House of Commons, was it a bit like your first day in Peterborough? <laughs> Architecture similar. Well, I'd never been to the House of Commons. Had you not? I'd never been to Westminster in my life. There was absolutely no reason to go there. I was, you know, very much a North Londoner. Yeah, I'd been to Oxford Street and Covent Garden, but I just, I'd never been to Westminster. Um, I'd never really been on that bit of the circle line. Uh, <laughs> I did know to get off of Westminster, yeah, but that's I... That's a clue. Uh, um, uh, it, 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 was a, it was an amazing experience for, for my family, people that have known me and people that had supported me. And let me just say many wonderful people in Peterborough, um, from SOAS, in the States, supported me um, uh, to get this far. There's wonderful lawyers that helped me go. So I actually get emotional thinking about it. It was a, yeah. it was a big deal. And it was a big deal to represent your community. And I, I um, in an era, I've got to tell you, where... Uh, you know, there were a lot of think tank types that were coming into Parliament, if you mm. like. There was a lot of kids that were doing PPE at Oxford, mm. working for Gordon Brown, <laughs> working for 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 
Tony Blair working for Margaret Thatcher <laughs> or uh, Nigel Lawson making their way to the House of Commons. Uh, you just covered the last uh, two or three uh, leaders of both parties <laughs> until we and, get to Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, 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 a careerist kind of energy had come into Parliament. I'm not, I, I would try not to say whether that's a good or bad thing, but I'm simply saying that was, well, there man. were loads of people that, and I, I... And yet you were very young and you hadn't... Too young, in maybe. In the context of a, what yeah. they refer to as a proper job, you hadn't done much no, more than the think tank no, no, kind of spad that's, type that's, people. That's fair enough. But what I would say to people is, um, I had bloody lived. Yeah. You know, yeah. I knew what it was to open the fridge and there was no food in it. Yeah. I knew what the stress of life could feel like. I knew what it was to be stopped and searched. I knew what it was to grow up without a dad. I knew what it was to go and visit a relative in prison. So I I, I had experienced quite a lot, yeah. um, even though I was 27. It's practical versus theoretical politics. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think also it did take me time to find a confidence yes. to not be thrown off by the kind of um, awesomeness of the commons, by mm. um, the Etonians uh, or the PP at Oxford types, and just to draw on who the hell I was um, uh, and really represent the people that I represent as fiercely as I could. And I and I and I think that um, by the end of the Tony Blair period, beginning of the Gordon Be Brown period, I really discovered my mojo. I have to say, I also took huge inspiration from what um, friends were doing in the United States. And by that, I mean uh, people like Barack Obama and Deval Patrick, who had become friends. At Harvard. Uh, well, because of the Harvard Black Alumni Network, we weren't there together. Right. But because we had an interest in politics, yes. we had begun to forge friendships across, across the water. And I took huge inspiration from them. And really, I think... Um, you know, probably from about 2007, 2008 on, um, the kind of David Lammy that I think I'm known for in politics was birthed. And, um, you know, I've just been... What, what sort of adjectives are we going to apply to that, David Lammy? And, and don't be modest. I'll start. Crusading? Maybe. <laughs> um, campaigning, yeah. crusading, um, um N not mocking, not mucking about with who I, what I think, and recognizing that my job in public life is to speak for a group of people who can't speak for themselves, as they see it, my constituents see it, um, and um, and so that's why I was the first to say that Brexit was madness, yeah, and that I'll never vote for it and never go for it and vote against Article Fifty. I said it the day after the vote. Why, why did so few other people have that? And and obviously, self interest is part of it. But but it, I mean, to me, I've been fairly forthright in my own views on Brexit. That it's so obvious that you did the right thing. It's so obvious that I struggle actually to get inside the heads of the people that didn't follow your lead. Worried about deselection. Worried about well, by election. Why? There's a lot of things going on. I mean, of course. I, but the I, rump I think, of people who thought it was a brilliant idea was tiny. Yeah, I think that. In Parliament. People were scared off because they're of this nonsense about the will of the people. Yeah. Uh, which Crush I've, the saboteurs, I've enemies never, of the people. I've never, ever bought because no, it's nonsense. Um, uh, m half of those voting did not go with this. Mm. Um, and I think the other, the other, th the Labour Party ended up in a contest to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. So we spent months yeah. talking about that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get up, caught up in that. I just didn't want to. I wanted to insist that this was the issue. Um, and, um, you know, I think people were thrown by it. Uh, I was very clear. And look, let me just be clear. Why was I clear? I think in the end, because I've grown up experiencing difference and experiencing prejudice all of my life. I was very clear because referendums are dangerous. And that's why Hitler used them so convincingly uh, and need to be very carefully interpreted. Uh, and this referendum should have been a two thirds majority, should have been, uh, should have, we should have really paid heed to what the various component parts of the United Kingdom were doing. This is the Scots, um, the Welsh, um, uh, the Northern Irish, as well as the English. Um, um, and in the end, 
um, I believe in parliamentary sovereignty, and that is ultimately you elect politicians to ultimately make that decision. And I believe that there has to be a second referendum on the terms of the deal. Um, it's the pendulum swinging. If we'd been talking six months ago, would you have been more or less optimistic? Of course optimistic? it's swinging. Of course John it's Major, swinging. But you were cheering John Major yesterday. Of course it's swinging. Was... James, let me just tell you why it's swinging. Because let us be under no doubt, this is a decision to put politics before economy. And that and the politics that we're putting before the economy um, can either be described as sovereignty or it can be described as um, concerns about immigration and free movement. At the heart of it, I believe there's quite a lot of prejudice and racism, and I want to call it what it is. It's dangerous when you put that kind of politics before economy. We know now that the people of the Northeast, 16% decline mm. in their... Of course, John Major was right. Of course, John Major... We're living in very dangerous times. And so perhaps because I see that lens of it, and I've always seen that lens of it, I've always understood that had Nigel Farage lost the vote, he would not have given up. So why the hell am I going to bloody give up? You must be joking. <laughs> the deal we have, a rebate... Um, the Atlantic relation with the states, but at the, but frankly, at the heart of Europe, without the euro, it's insane to trade that for the for the hodgepodge we're now going to get. Packet of crisps. Um, um, a, a packet of crisps is being generous because we will not have a bloody trade deal once we've exited the EU. It takes ages to negotiate one, and this ridiculous imperial crap that we are going to have the weight with China and America uh, not to get completely done over on a trade deal is, is laughable. And what it really is, is a deregulated Britain that will either become a 51st state of America that will be some sort of horribly de deregulated offshoot of Europe, I find deeply politically unattractive. And it's hugely important that people discover their mojo and fight hard for the Britain and the values they believe in. You must have people on the other side of this argument who you have historically quite liked and respected, though. You speak so stridently. You're, you're preaching to the choir with me, so we don't need to um, a, a examine your position. I understand it completely. But th I'm interested in, in how you rationalise people, whether they're in your party or not. You must have friends in the Conservative Party, people on the other side of this debate who you just can't understand why they're still going down the path they're going down or not. Well, I, funny enough, I shared a platform with Ian Duncan Smith there you go. last night. Yeah. Um, Ian and I get on. Do you? Uh, he's a Spurs supporter. <laughs> Um, uh, we are both Christian and have shared Christian platforms. I, just, my Christian, I don't want to sound like I'm no, no, zealous, no, but everyone it, does it, this now. As soon as you say a, you're Christian, everyone feels they have to I, say I, sorry. I, well, I That's don't want to say sorry. Problem. It is a part of me. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I go to church. It, it's cool. Yeah, great. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, amen. <laughs> um, we are in fundamentally different places. We were sharing a pl platform on poverty. Um, but you can do so, you know, what I've tried to do is play, um, you know, is play the ball, not the man. I, I try to play the issues. I'm not compromising in my language, but I, I, I try not to play. Now, sometimes individuals come along that I find it very hard not to just give them a... And one came along very recently, Toby Young. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry, when it comes to eugenics, mm. when it comes to the language around disability, race women, uh, you know, I, I am going to single out that particular individual because I believe that that kind of, that that those attitudes are so dangerous. They he he would claim he was embarked but, on a journalistic exploration yeah, at the yeah, time yeah, of some of the yeah, things yeah, he attended. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's not my job to blow hot air up his backside. It's to absolutely call it for what it is, dangerous. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of noise in society at the moment. There's a lot, you know, the, 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 um, the social media, the, the, the kind of tribalism, uh, uh, which is, a, you know, I'm working on a second book, which, mm. I, which I'm thinking a lot about, means that, you know, just that clarity of thought is not clear always. Uh, in the political parties, from politicians, from political commentators. And sometimes I think you've just got to be really, really firm about what you believe in, what is good and what is evil, frankly. 
and which is why today, I mean, the, the, the interview will go out a little later than today, but you, you couldn't contain your fury at Nadine Dorries employing the word traitor to describe a former Conservative Prime Minister. Yeah, I, well, you know, I suppose Twitter sort of ramps up these terms, but I, let's think really hard about what that is about when yeah. you call someone a traitor, when you say that someone doesn't love it's their inside. country. Yeah. I, you know, I, uh, John Major and I d would, uh, would disagreed on so much when I was uh, at, uh, at SOAS and mm. at Harvard. But I, I, I sense nothing in him that doesn't love his country. That's why he's come out to take these um, attacks. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, nothing, actually. Um, uh, that hasn't got a sense of decency and concern um, we're living in these extraordinary sort of these people that have this deep ideologies, and also well, we're not well. Not, not in the case of Nadine Torres. I think well, there's nothing deep about well, her. But, yeah. but some, <laughs> some, of, some of the people she fetishizes yeah, yeah, seem to have. Yeah, I'll tell you my fair. Nadine Torres story very quickly. Go this on. will make you laugh. So I, I stuck something on Twitter. She tweets back, calls me a public school posh boy fuckwit. Right? I get a text from a, a, a lad I haven't seen for years. He says, oh, "You know where her daughters went to school?" I went where. It's an ample fourth. It's exactly the same public school I went to. You're joking. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. That's the level You're of her intellect. Joking. Which is why it's frightening that but they the have... hypocrisy oh, of it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's weapons grade, <laughs> isn't it? It's, it's unbelievable. So let, let's park that. We're going to run out of time. I knew yeah. this would happen. The, the ultimate, for me, uh, distillation of everything you've said about voiceless people, representation, campaign, crusade, it happened at Grenfell Tower. It's happened in the aftermath of Grenfell Tower. How, how shocked are you still at the state's response to that tragedy? Well, I think the last I'd heard, there were a, a hundred families in emergency accommodation. And what does that mean? It means not great bed and breakfast. It means sharing a room with your kids. Um, it means a huge sense of displacement. It means staring at that hell on earth vision of that tower on a daily basis. Um, it means the inability to properly grieve and get over your trauma or begin that journey. Um, we were told that they'd all be housed within three weeks. They have been so badly let down and I spend time with those people and I just weep. And I think of my friend Khadija Say, mm. um, who interned with my wife, um, who was me. She was, you know, so like, you know, she was really emerging. 24, wonderful young woman, really emerging. You know, she'd, you know, grown up poor in, in, in Grenfell, but really struggled, made good. She'd got a little scholarship at 16 to rugby school. She'd gone to university. Her art was, was on fire. And, uh, you know... She died, and I know why she died. She died because of the advice to stay put. And, you know, working class people always, we always believe the advice that comes from people who, who wear suits or wear a uniform. She died because she lived with her mother. Um, and I, I know uh, because of the messages that she was sending at three o'clock in the morning that she didn't want to leave her mother in that flat. Um, and she made it from the 20-odd 20, 20 floor, and she died on the ninth floor. She almost got out. And because she's dead, and on behalf of all those people, who I feel I know, hmm. because, um, you know, I spent so much of my life in Broadwater Farm Estate, I know those estates, I know those families. I'm not going to give up this fight. I'm never going to go off calling this what I think it is. I don't say I'm completely impartial. I'm not. I'm hugely affected by Grenfell, not as affected in any sense as the families that were that caught up in it. But what I'm saying is I've got a personal connection to it. Um, I think that this amounts to a to a, a kind of gross negligence manslaughter. Um, uh, I think those people were badly let down. Um, the state has a terrible habit when it sets up inquiries of kicking things into the long grass. Um, there are lots of ways in which these people can be othered, can be described as immigrants, different, Muslim, um, um, and um, 
I'm never going to give up on my my responsibility or the little role I can play um, in public life to stand up for those people on, the, on behalf of those people. Do you have faith in the inquiry? Well, I have to have faith because it's all we've got, but it's got off to a very bad start. Um, I think that... Um, uh, Mr. Morbick has not been able to command the trust of the community. I think it's a huge Could anyone, mistake. Could anyone have come Yeah, on? look, when the Lawrence Inquiry was set up, uh, McPherson was a white upper middle class man leading it. He had as his wingmen um, Johnson Tamu hmm. um, and a wonderful Jewish um, activist and, and academic, Richard Stone. And um, so you can do it. Yeah. And he commanded the trust of um, uh, Doreen Lawrence. It, it can be done, um, um, but it hasn't happened on this occasion. Um, and, you know, there's a petition. Um, there'll be a further debate in Parliament about the nature of this inquiry. Um, but I think there've been some, there've been some wrong moves. Let's be, let's be absolutely clear on that. Someone said to me the other day that it, it Hillsborough couldn't have happened at Twickenham. And, and it took me a while to work out what they meant. <laughs> and obviously what they meant was that if it had been a stadium full of connected middle class, in this case Southern, although the geography is irrelevant, it's a class-based observation because Grenfell, of course, uh, burned in the richest borough in Britain. It, it, this has got class written all over it with that added complication of race and ethnicity. So, some of the stuff that's come out post-Grenfell, I'm a radio phoning host. I get exposed to the, I seek out the ugliest elements of our society to engage and, and to deliberately provoke and argue. I couldn't believe some of what I saw people saying about those families, the, the ones that died and the ones that lived, the ones that, it shook my faith in human nature yeah. more than anything else yeah. I can remember. And, and, and yet, Regardless of ethnicity and asylum status or refugee status, it, it, the, the, the more time passes between the tragedy and today, the more it looks like class. It Absolutely. And I'm so glad we're sort of ending here because um, <laughs> I want to say absolutely that um, as an ethnic minority, whilst race is often at the forefront of the things that I end up having to talk about, class sits alongside that. Mm. Um, this is about what it means to be poorer, what it means to not have a voice, uh, what it means to live in a terribly hierarchical system. It's why when I challenge Oxford and Cambridge a few months ago on who gets to go, it's as much about geography. You know, why the London boroughs of Barnet and Richmond are sending more kids than the whole of Leeds, the whole of Sheffield, the whole of Manchester, the whole of Scotland combined. Um, uh, when people challenge me on Brexit and my position on Brexit, you know, I say to them, look, of course, people um, in the industrial north, seaside towns have been badly let down, badly let down. But they've been let down by successive governments, not by Europe. Um, where, are the, where, where are the night schools in Britain? I've got this mm. campaign. Bring back night schools. If, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're in a dead end job, where can you go to study to skill up and get, get into that economy? In any bloody town in Britain, much past... 7.30 in the yeah. evening. Nowhere, basically, yeah. is the answer, apart from City Lit in London and Birkbeck. Um, so, look, the working class context of old European countries are very, very real. Very, very real. And Grenfell could absolutely have been in Sunderland or Gateshead. Mm. Uh, the story could have been very, very similar. Um May have, so, got, may have got even uh, less coverage, the, the, actually. So, so in the end, it's why I'm happy to describe myself as a socialist. Um, I'm happy to say that I am in this business to try and give voice to the voiceless, to, to talk about inequality uh, and to talk about race and class and to come back to those issues time and time and time again and to stick to those issues, which, trying to be as truthful as I can be. Which will make Grenfell the defining issue of our time, perhaps, if, if for people who care about the things you've just I, described. I, I, I hope so, but but at the centre of Grenfell it is, is basically the housing crisis. Mm. Um, and it's a housing crisis I don't see getting better. At the centre of Grenfell is is um, is basically the, the big divide in Britain between the asset class, those of us in London who bought houses in the 80s, 90s, they're now worth a fortune, London or the South East, mm. 
of a certain age and the rest of the population who are either in parts of the country where they have not seen those increases or they're young people who have no prospect of getting on the housing ladder in a context in which also there is now no public housing. We've turned our back on council housing and we encourage people to take a state subsidy to actually buy their council house from the state. It's criminal. It's absolutely criminal and the divide is getting worse. That's at the heart of the story. And I mean, until Britain faces up to that, faces up to the 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 the, the wonderful casino that it is to own a property mm. in London and how uh, tax-free by by the way because we own a property it's a sort of tax-free asset how how fortunate you are relative to anyone who's not in that circumstance. We're nearly done. Where do you derive your optimism? We, we've covered a lot of bleak territory, but you you you, you have a lovely demeanour. You're a happy man. Um, why? <laughs> Given that the world is is falling apart around our ears at the moment, David. Well, I think that the baby boomers have really messed up. I think the baby boomers have heated up the planet. They've bankrupted the planet. They've really enjoyed themselves. This all began when they were taking loads of drugs in the sixties. Um, um, and maybe their kids, the millennials, have sorted it all out. I think they're going to get a rougher deal. I think we're in a, we're in a rough period, and that rough period is going to go on for 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 some time. This is globally, but um, as one patrician Tory said to me, David, it's it's ghastly, it's awful, it's like the 1930s. But all I can say is, when we get out of this mess, the 60s is going to look tame. <laughs> so there's a big party. There's so a I big think, party I think the we corner. will get out of it eventually, <laughs> and it's going to be great. But 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 it's going to be stormy for a while. David Lammy, thank you so much. Thank you.